Let's get started, folks. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see so many familiar faces, and I realize that the, some of the faces who aren't familiar I know by name, so that's great. Welcome. I'm glad you. Oh, I'm closer. Okay. Oh, that's much better. Okay. So, welcome. It's great to see all of you. I'm not used to speaking in a mic. I'm also not used to running the meeting. Anthony is having surgery, so um, he, he said it's going to be a safe surgery, and that's why he's not here. And I always say that, uh, I always get nervous before the meetings, and I say that once I get to the meeting, if I see Anthony and Josh, I'm all set. So you can help out. I would like somebody to um, help make sure I'm, uh, Anthony's always really good about, he's good about many things. And his chill, wise personality is one of those things. So if somebody can help me try to stick to the timeline, I would appreciate that. We have, as usual, a very packed agenda, so we may, um, you know, we may go over on some things, and um, we'll just see how it goes. So, Marielle, yes. I just wanted to let people know that Anthony's surgery went very, very well. Good. Oh, thank you. That's I, the report. Okay, that's perfect. That's really good to hear. Yeah, I mean, even though he was, I mean, he had some concerns, why wouldn't you? But uh, he was pretty calm about it at the same time. So that is really good news because you know, there are, okay, there are, anyway, that's great news. Um, okay, so uh, we have lost a couple of um, ardent progressives, Steve May and Dean Corrin, and I had sent out an email asking if anybody knew them. I didn't know them. I read the obituaries. Uh, Josh knows them, but if we have to take just a few minutes to say some nice things about them and let people know about the kind of work that they did, I think that would be a good way to start the meeting. There's a hand up in the back. Sure. Hi. Uh, my name is Erhard. Uh, Erhard Maka. Uh, been a uh, involved with the party since the beginnings. I was a former Burlington City Councilor back in the Bernie days in the 80s and was uh, actually lived close to Dean, worked on his first campaign, which he lost by eight votes, um, and then fortunately uh, won all of his successive campaigns except when he ran for Lieutenant Governor. Um, Dean was I'm just devastated by his untimely loss. Um, he was just a, a, just a wonderful human being. Um, he was way ahead of his time. Uh, for many years, Dean served, for folks who don't know him, served uh, with Terry Baricius, uh and then uh, also, um, I think for a while, with Tom Smith, Martha, right, was yeah, at Tom the same Smith. time, right? Yeah. Um, and um, was, far, he was one of the people who really, uh, I think, made us very aware of, uh, you know, climate change and the uh, impacts much earlier than, you know, most people became aware of it, um, that at the same time that, uh, Howard Dean uh, signed uh, civil civil unions. Dean was already introducing uh, legislation for uh, gay marriage, so way way ahead, uh, like years, literally ahead on that. Um, before he became a rep, he was a, a Burlington um, Electric uh, uh, Department Commissioner, um, and this was at a time when Burlington Electric um, was saying no to Hydro Quebec because of uh, the damage that it did to indigenous lands up in uh, northern. Uh, Northern Quebec. Uh, it was when BED first um, issued its uh, first energy conservation bond, um, first in the state. Uh, Efficiency Vermont didn't exist yet. So Dean was like at the cutting edge of so many different things. He was a very strong advocate for uh, universal health care, single payer, uh, very strong advocate for that. And uh, you, some of you may know that he ran for lieutenant governor unsuccessfully with both Democratic and <clears throat> progressive endorsement. Um, just a wonderful person, brilliant. He was also an inventor. Um, Dean invented um, a uh, special uh, turbine um, for harnessing uh, energy. Uh, there's actually uh, in one or more of them, I can't remember how many, are installed in the East River uh, in, uh, in New York City, generating um, power for Con, uh, Con Edison. Um, he worked for an outfit called Verdant Power. So um, Dean, um, yeah, brilliant, 
brilliant guy, really smart, really ahead of his times, and just a wonderful human being. So, um, that's Liz? Liz Blum. Uh, I just want to add to Thank that. You, wonderful remembrance of Dean. Vermont does not have deregulation of electricity yeah. because of Dean mm -hmm. Corrin. Yes. And it, 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 he was amazing. And the other thing is, Dean, we couldn't find anybody to run for lieutenant governor. And Dean stepped up and did it. And we got money for him to run with public finance. And we worked really hard for that. And then Attorney General Sorrell yeah, sued right. Dean, which cost him a lot of money. And he did it as a retribution because this is how I see it. Ellen David Friedman, in 1984, defeated his mother for Democratic National Committee. <laughs> for those of us old people who remember them. <laughs> and he wanted to get back at the, Bill Sorrell wanted to get back at the progressives, so he sued Dean. O over nothing, by the way. Right. It was, and, and he was over the email, literally. Yeah. <laughs> cost, a, cost a family. Anyone else? Am I right about that, Martha? I believe so. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> David? Um, well, I guess I want to say a couple things. I want to make sure Steve May isn't sort of left out of the yeah. conversation. Um, and what a, you know, two different sudden losses to our community. And Steve was devoted, dedicated, and was, you know, always trying to be there and, and help folks running and put him, he was on the ballot a number of times as well, uh, carrying the progressive banner. Um, and so that was, was a shock to hear. I, I, I'm gonna, I am gonna go back to Dean for a moment. Uh, Dean was the person that asked me to run for the House mm -hmm. in 1994. Um, and we ran a number of campaigns together. Uh, he had been in, I think, one term, and then he served three more, uh, of which I lost that first one. So we served two terms together. So those three races, uh, I mean, I lived at his house. Earhart lived at his house quite a bit, too. We would door knock in the neighborhoods from 5 till 8 or 8.30, and then we would go up to UVM and door knock from 8.30 until someone kicked us out, sometime usually between 11 and midnight. Yeah. And we would do this day after day. And so the dedication to getting young people involved, uh, the effort that he put in to help me, um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be where I am right now if he hadn't asked me to run 30 years ago. Um, and uh, it was just mentioned, you know, public financing, uh, end of life choices. He had bills that I co-sponsored in the late 90s uh, which is why folks came back to me in 2004 to get that ball rolling again. But Dean was the one that put those out forth. And same with marriage equality. I think even before the civil unions yeah. court case, um, he had a bill in. Um, and uh, and I have to say the the statewide reality for progressives and the state house reality for progressives was extraordinarily different then than it is now. The uh, metaphorical uh, arrows, bullets, slings, punches, whatever violent language you want to use that Dean and Terry took for putting out issues and standing up with, with firmness for these incredibly important economic and democracy mm -hmm. and, and equality issues um, was really unbelievable. Uh, the Democrats, who are doing it a little now with the election law a little bit, but at the time were progressives are out to destroy the Democrats, we are going to destroy the progressives. Um, and uh, which was really amazing that a fly could hurt, uh, I was going to say an elephant, but I guess a donkey <laughs> that much. Um, but the dean took a it day in it. A donkey. What did I say? Did I not say donkey? A donkey. Yeah, yeah no, I said switch a donkey, yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, I've gone on too long, but um, much too young, uh, an incredible loss, and not just politically, but just a, a, a funny, kind person. Um, you know, he was washing plastic bags in his sink, you know, back when I was at his house in the mid late 90s. Um, really visionary. Cindy? I don't know if you can hear me. Um, 
I have a little bit to say about both, but not too much. Um, Steve would usually call me when he had an issue or he wanted to do something or he wanted to run or he wanted support from the progressives. He, he felt that he could talk to me and I would always call him back and we'd have an interesting conversation and I would be as pragmatic as I could be with Steve, so I was very surprised to see this today. And as far as Dean, uh, as people know, I, I ran and served and lost and everything else. Uh, he supported my last campaign. So, I mean, he is still supporting progressives. And uh, a few years ago, probably eight years ago, when I had a big event in Enosburg, he drove all the way from Chittenden County to Enosburg, him and his wife, to support me. So I, I Dean, I wished I had got to know him better, and I was really interested to hear that he was an inventor. My dad was an inventor simil in the similar vein, so uh, very sad to see about both today. They're both, you know, great people. You should just reintroduce yourself. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, I think I skipped this step, but I should introduce myself. I am Mary L. Blay, and I'm the vice chair of the Progressive Party. <laughs> and I was very relieved since GPS wasn't picking up VTC that when I got here, I saw spoons. I thought, okay, this is the right place. And then I recognize a lot of you. I'm. Uh, it's, it's kind of like. Uh, I was a teacher for many years, and it's a little bit like high school teaching because I would, most, most of you are in the back. <laughs> but we're friendly. It's fine if you want to sit in front. And please let me know. I can, I can easily pass the mic if anyone needs it. Uh, I don't. I always get annoyed when somebody says, oh, I have a loud voice. I don't need the mic. And I said, no, you need the mic. So I'm happy to jump around. Uh, Josh, if you could scroll down to the bottom so we can see the names of the new co-members. Yes, um, what I'll actually do is I'll put it, I'll okay. show the website. Okay. If that works. Yeah. I think that might be. That would be easier. So we have five, five or six? Um, five. Five. We have five new members of the COCO. And I don't know, are any of you here? Okay, great. So. We'd like, if you could introduce yourself, that would be great, and then we'll mention the others. And so. Hello, everyone. I'm Lynn Barnes. I live in Waitsfield, and I... Start <laughs> 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 it. <laughs> I live in Waitsfield. Um, I've been involved with the Progressive Party for several years, and um, I've worked on a number of campaigns. Um, I'm really excited to be part of the party's COCO. Um, I'm working on the organizing committee to help build the party and to get more people involved, and we're going to talk more about that uh, later in the meeting, but I'm really happy to be here and invite all of you are too. Thanks for volunteering. Oh, just organizing for a few minutes now on the agenda. Um, so yeah, so yeah, it's been amazing working with Lynn. She's we're going to talk later, but she's the new chair of our organizing committee as well. So that's been that's been really awesome to be able to work with her on that. Um, so we're really happy to have Lynn on board. Um, so the other new members of the coordinating committee, and I just want to say too, like. Um, we had a really good process around this, and a bunch of people, um, we had more people apply for this position, these positions, than we had um, openings. And um, we did a forum, online forum, which I know many people participated in, and we sent out electronic ballots. And I, I know I was really happy with the process um, going into it. And um, I'm also happy that everyone who did not get elected um, is engaged in the committee in some, some way or another. Um, so that's always really good to see. So yeah, we also have um, Jose Aguayo, um, who has some friends from Texas in town today, so had reached out and couldn't make it. Um, so that's, you know, he's, he's totally excused on that. Um, and then we have Liz Filscalf, who 
is down in um, the Rutland area, and she used to be with the Democrats, and she's been with RAD, and um, she had reached out and expressed interest in getting involved with us, so she's one of the regional advisors. Um, and the regional advisors, just so you know, currently they're non-voting, and this is something we're working to address in the bylaws, which we'll hear about later, um, and actually make those kind of voting, voting positions. Um, and then I do actually see Liz Blum is here, so yeah, you, you thought you were going to get away with not introducing yourself, but I'm not going to let that happen. <laughs> I'm sure most of you probably know Liz, but... Hi, you know who I am now. <laughs> I live in Norwich, and I'm one of the founders of the party, and uh, I think there's like six or seven of us here, <laughs> the original people, and I was on the original Coco for about four years, and I want to keep the party strong and grow, so I volunteered to do this, and I am a member of the organizing committee, because I'd rather be an organizer than a fundraiser or a <laughs> bylaw writer. But thank you, Elijah. <laughs> Elijah is a second generation progressive. Yeah. Thanks, Liz. Yeah, it's been, I've been working with Liz since I started with the party back in 2016, and it's been awesome to work with her. Um, and then we also have Will Anderson, and Will um, was a recent, he also couldn't make it, um, but he was a recent city council candidate in Burlington. He also works um, for Vermont State Government. He's kind of a policy guru, I would say. Um, really, really good with numbers, and he's been active on our communications committee and really helping us think through um, you know, policy issues like in a very detailed, um, detail-oriented way. So he's been like absolutely wonderful to have in this new leadership role. Um, younger guy, maybe you know, late twenties, early thirties, I would say. Um, but Will's Will's really great, and um, it's really good to have his energy as someone who you know doesn't just know the issues, but also knows the numbers. Um, so that's that's been really really helpful because so often I think you know we have big ideas and we don't necessarily have the you know, the people who can go through and, you know, write, write a detailed budget and show why something that the administration is doing or something that, um, you know, city government is doing doesn't make sense from like a num numbers and an economic perspective. So he's been really helpful in helping us frame issues from, from that lens. Um, so yeah, those are our new COCO um, members. We're going to be, um, everyone's up for election again. Um, coming up in November, so everyone um, currently on the COCO will have to run for re-election and we'll have a full open process around that and new people can step up. Um, we haven't gone through um, or thought through who on the current COCO is stepping down, um, but that's gonna be coming up in, um, in a few months. So if anyone else wants to run, we really encourage it at that point um, because we would love to have you and we need a vibrant, healthy, um, energized, coordinating committee always, so thanks so much. Okay, next I'd like to introduce, well, I don't know, I don't think she needs a lot of introduction, but Taylor Small is here and she is going to be presenting the legislative update and Taylor, you told me there might be another House member meeting you, but you're on your own? Oh, you're gonna get a six in one here. Oh, right. Also, David. Also, David. Oh. And David. And David. And David. How could I forget David? Here's the mic. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm going to set this down right over here. Wonderful, y'all. Good morning. Wonderful to see you. Uh, I'm going to go through just a very in legislative speak high level overview of the various bills that we were able to pass this year um, and that progressives also worked on. Sorry, Mary. That's okay. I'm to, and I'm uh, take notes. Oh, good. And we'll have uh, David be my backup here for anything that I might have missed on the Senate side, as we only have one senator um, over there. Um, these are in uh, just numerical order, not in order of importance, though I will start with a bill that I uh, co-sponsored this year, H89, um, which was accompanied with S37. These are our Vermont Shield Law bills, uh, declaring reproductive health care and gender-affirming care as legally protected health care in the state of Vermont, 
and protecting Vermonters and our providers from any abusive litigation that may be coming from other states that are attacking such access to health care. Um, this really was a preemptive response to some of the restrictive laws that we've seen in other states and really showing Vermont as that, that safe uh, space for folks to be able to access health care. Once we get universal health care, that will be even better. Uh, H165, we passed universal school meals this year. Uh, it was a very interesting conversation as it made its way through the house in particular about expanding uh, universal school meals for all students, not just as uh, students in need. Uh, this was uh, two uh, reasons why we did it this way. One is it allowed for more federal drawdowns so that we were able to get a federal match uh, for this program and not have to spend as many state dollars uh, by providing this for all students across the board as well as recognizing stigma when we only uh, allow students who are in need to be able to access free or reduced lunch um, it starts to point out who has and who has not um, and so this just makes it an even playing field so everyone can get breakfast in the morning and lunch before they head home at the end of the day uh, H217 was, uh, became a more complicated bill at the end of the session. Started out as a workers' comp bill, uh, must pass to update our systems here, and ended up also being our child care bill at the end. Uh, the Senate tacked on a mixture of our language in regards to policy for child care and their funding mechanism, which was an income tax uh, for the child care program. Really what this did was expand access to the Child Care Financial Assistance Program for Vermonters. So it now states that anyone under 165% of the federal poverty level uh, will not have to pay a copay for child care in the state of Vermont. And then copays will start at 166% all the way up to 550% of the federal poverty level, um, really expanding who is able to get access to child care. A more important aspect of this bill, I would say, is really supporting our child care workers. We know that this is a very uh, fragile workforce. It is really teetering on the edge of uh, just crumbling apart. And so we want to increase reimbursements for our child care providers. So we have a standard reimbursement across the board instead of basing it on ratings and quality. And then on top of that, we recognize the importance of our family child care homes. So the smaller programs, especially out in rural Vermont. Um, and learned about this disparity in reimbursements where child care centers were getting a higher reimbursement no matter what, while the fa uh, family child care homes did not get the same level of reimbursement. So we increased that about 50% of the way, so we made it halfway there to bring it to parity, and are intending in the next session to bring that into parity for child care centers and family child care homes. I'll pause to see if there are questions yet as I do such quick overviews. Yes. Are these things that passed that you're describing? Yes. Everything that I'm describing right now is our past legislation. I will mention the ones that did not pass or are still being worked on. Um, H-222 was our big uh, reducing overdoses bill this year. Um, at first, I was, I'll be honest with you, I wasn't very excited to take very meager steps in trying to address an overdose crisis that is really uh, coming before us. Uh, last year, we set another record in the number of overdose deaths in the state, and we are leading the nation when it comes to overdose deaths overall. And so what this really did was took very incremental steps around creating parity for our hubs and spokes system, um, trying to reduce the uh, issues that come up with prior authorizations and getting access to medication-assisted treatment, it uh, also looked at expanding access to naloxone and sending up vending machines in various communities so folks can access naloxone uh, more readily. What was really exciting to see added was not only the appropriations through our uh, opioid abatement fund, so the funding that is coming from the pharmaceutical industry to address this crisis, a crisis that they have created, um, and one piece that was included that was not in the original recommendations from the committee that put this forward uh, was around drug checking. Uh, this is an integral piece in addressing overdoses in Vermont and nationally. And so it really puts us on the leading edge. Not many states have this in place where it's uh, spectrometers that essentially go into our syringe service programs or community health agencies where folks are able to take their pre-obtained drugs, have it tested so they know exactly what they are using before using it. 
what has become really prevalent in uh, the drugs across Vermont is that we're not really even seeing heroin on the streets now. It is just all fentanyl. Um, it's what we hear up in Canada as well. And now with the inclusion of other drugs such as xylazine, we don't have the reversal medications in place to actually reverse an overdose if someone were to, uh, to take those drugs. And so the drug checking systems would allow folks to know what they're using and also allow providers to know what they might need to use as an antagonist um, in case an overdose were to happen. I will also highlight that our House Human Services Committee also passed out a bill out of our committee but won't be taken up for consideration um, in appropriations in the Senate until next year uh, to allow for safe consumption sites or um, previously known as safe injection facilities, uh, supervised uh, facilities for folks to use pre-obtained drugs to reduce overdose death. Of course, this is not the panacea. This isn't the answer to addressing the overdose crisis, but it is uh, the answer to addressing our overdose death crisis in Vermont. Um, to really help folks get into treatment and to reduce using overall, we have to make sure they're alive in the first place. Another bill that came up, H230, uh, which was a suicide reduction bill, but really was also a firearm safety. Um, and this looked at three, uh, ways that we can reduce uh, firearm harm in our communities in particular when it comes to suicide. So looking at red flag laws, so who would be able to initiate um, whether someone's firearm should be taken away, specifically looking at uh, domestic violence or sexual violence situations. Uh, safe storage of various firearms, so promoting uh, safe storage and ensuring that folks have access to safe storage in their homes. And then um, better background checks so that folks aren't able to get a, a firearm the same day. We know that typically when folks are looking to get a firearm in the same day, um, it is either to harm themselves or others. So uh, trying to prevent that or put a, more barriers in place before folks can get access to a firearm. This next one everyone has definitely heard about, 429, the elections bill that I wish would just um, be done, but it's not. Uh, so in the House, we really fought against the fusion provision, which would eliminate the opportunity for folks to run as fusion candidates. Um, other pieces that were in the bill is increasing contributions from candidates to their parties. Uh, when it left the House, it was at 60,000. Um, as it's leaving the Senate right now, it's down to 20,000. Uh, originally, it was 10,000. So we are making incremental change to just roll that one back. Other provisions in there are the, the quote unquote sore loser law. So if someone were to not win in their primary, they wouldn't be able to run in another uh, uh, party's uh, general election or be able to run as an independent. And to really solidify that, they've even looked to move the independent filing date up before the general election um, to make sure that if you are going to run as independent, you already have to have that registration ahead of time. Something that came out of the bill when it left the House but got put back in in the Senate was around writing candidates. Uh, this would put a provision in that would say that you would have to register as a writing candidate for your votes to be tallied um, and that they would only be valid if you got at least, I believe, 10% of the vote or some ridiculous number like that. Do you remember, David? Yeah, I'll go to, I'll go, because we're going to do some more lectures. Oh, so you go right wonderful. <laughs> I'll let David dig into that one then. Um, and to really try to give it some legs back in the House, um, they put the ranked choice voting bill into that one overall, um, which would implement ranked choice voting for presidential elections in 2027. Looking over to the Senate, um, I only have two bills that I'm really going to highlight from them. I'm not a senator, y'all, so. Um, <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> um, who knows if I really want to go over there, though. Uh, S100, uh, the Omnibus Housing Bill. I wish I could go into all of the details of what was included in this, um, but I'm happy to answer any specific questions that folks might have. A couple pieces I will highlight is um, that it focuses on municipal zoning changes. There are some Act 250 exemptions within this bill. Um, an expansion of development in designated downtowns and for priority housing projects. Uh, in the House, as some movement that we tried to do was recognizing the impending homelessness crisis that is going to hit our communities starting at the end of this month. 
um, and recognizing that municipalities need all the tools that they can to address this crisis. And so we wanted to move up the municipal zoning bylaws so that each municipality is prepared to have zoning for emergency shelters when that program ends on July 1st. Uh, sadly, the committee gave some pushback, and so it will be September 1st instead, but at least it is much better than the December 1st of 2024 that was originally in the bill. Uh, we also let, look to set a standard for when we are going to provide housing for those who are homeless or housing insecure, especially in the winter months. And so we put a proposal forward around um, what is currently an adverse weather conditions policy put forward by the department. Uh, something I'd like to highlight about policies in the department is that we actually have no legislative oversight on policies that are created. Um, we don't have any approval. We only learn about them when there is typically an issue with the policy itself, and then we would have to put law or rulemaking in place. And so prior to the pandemic, this adverse weather conditions policy meant that folks could access housing if uh, the weather was under 20 degrees Fahrenheit or it was under 30 degrees Fahrenheit with more than a 50% chance of precipitation. Meaning that someone who is already homeless would have to access the forecast to know whether or not they would get housing for just that one night and if the weather changed the next day then they were back out on the streets. Uh, during COVID-19, the department implemented that it was a date-to-date -date, uh, range. So folks would be in housing from uh, November 15th to April 15th. And we were trying to look at Vermont data. When does the first frost happen? And when do we know that uh, winter is most likely ending in the state of Vermont? And so we have two of those data points. And we looked at when the first frost happens, which is typically around November 1st. And we thought to look at Joe's Pond up in the Northeast Kingdom for when the ice out happens. And that is typically around May 1st. So we thought, what a great range to put in there. Sadly, it was not taken up by the committee and the department came forward saying it would be about a $70 million expenditure. Um, but that seems like an inflated number at the end of the day. So um, we'll take that one with a grain of salt. Okay, I only have a few more for you, I promise. Um, S-103 was expanded um, employment protections and public accommodations protections. Um, this is something that Representative Emma mulvaney Stanek worked hard on um, in expanding who is covered by these protections, in particular looking at gender identity, race, and disability status. Um, in the House, we also tried to apply this to education and for our students, recognizing that what this was about to create was a disparity for, um, if we look at school districts in particular, teachers would have more protections when it comes to discrimination that they are facing in the school rather than the students themselves. And so those were questions that we raised on the floor. Is this a disparity where if a teacher and a student were being harassed by the same person, who would have more protections? And it was. It was the teacher time and time again. Um, there was commitment from the House Education Committee that they are going to work on <laughs> uh, protections for students in the next uh, legislative year. Uh, they even put a short form bill forward, but we are going to hold the pressure on to make sure that we are not uh, continuing that disparity. Last couple of things, uh, 493, our capital budget. Um, usually we don't dig too much into this one, but there were con some concerns this year, especially when we're looking at the future of the women's prison. Um, we have pushed hard to really re-examine our industrial complex around uh, keeping folks out of community when they've caused harm. Um, and instead, what we see once again is a $13 million um, induction of funds to plan and map out a new women's facility in the state of Vermont. Um, they told us it will be a nice prison, though, so that is supposed to give us the reassurance. Um, though the number of beds that they are planning for um, is much higher than we have seen in the state of Vermont, um, and it's concerning on many levels. And lastly, the budget. Um, budget, an $8.5 billion budget that we passed out of the General Assembly this year. Um, with some great investments, I will say, uh, especially when we think about our local municipalities and supporting them and addressing various crises. Um, but where we had a, a strong sticking point, again, was the emergency housing program. Um, we have tried to work with the administration and our colleagues in the House and Senate to really identify a just and humane transition for folks out of the motels as they go into permanent supportive housing. The plan as it currently stands is to give not enough funds to our municipalities to address this crisis while uh, kicking 3,000 people out onto the streets and saying best of luck. 
because we don't have any shelter beds available. We don't have any um, affordable housing units. Uh, I always look to Lamoille County on this one, and there is not even a rental that is affordable for someone who is coming up and might even just need a, a down payment for their facility. So. All that to say, we were really pushing for, of course, a full funding of this program, recognizing that um, if the solutions were put in place, you wouldn't have to use all of those funds and that they could be diverted elsewhere. But what we really need is a continuum and an encapsulation of care and services, uh, which were not there during the pandemic. And then really ended with the sticking point of all we need is a transition plan, which would cost about $25 million. That's 0.3% of the budget overall that we passed. Um, to really make sure that folks are not out on the street. We are talking about uh, families with children. 75% uh, of the participants have a disability. Um, I know I'm preaching to the choir on this one, but it is something that we are continuing to work on right now, um, coming up with a new budget proposal that might be considered during the veto session, um, and that would be dependent on whether or not the governor vetoes the budget in the first place. But otherwise, working with the agency as well to see what flexibility in the funding that we did put into the budget could be used to actually keep folks in housing rather than providing them services with no housing. I don't pause there. I threw a lot at y'all to see if you have any questions. Yeah. Um, I, I work basically as a town planning professional, and most of the changes that have been uh, basically mandated by S100, the town I work for, we've done this for years already. I've built nine housing units in a decade. So obviously the zoning changes, while necessary, and I believe they are necessary, are not sufficient. So there needs to be money in the pipeline so that the housing trusts can pencil out projects smaller than 32 units. Uh, Andrew Winter has told me that if, if you're trying to build less than 32 housing units, they can't help you. Uh, just simply because the subsidy to close the gap funding isn't there. So if, if you guys could address the gap funding next session, that would be real help for us in the trenches on the town level trying to get housing built. Absolutely, and I'm so glad you brought this up because uh, a recognition is that the legislature has not been uh, funding our legislatively mandated uh, amount to the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, which is about $25 million a year. Um, and so to make up with that with a surplus of funds, we have about $60 million that is being invested in this budget uh, to the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board with about $10 million specifically earmarked for the expansion of emergency shelters, uh, motel reconversions uh, for additional housing, and permanent supportive housing for folks who are experiencing homelessness. So, a piece of the puzzle is coming in with some funding as well. Excellent. I'm gonna go Carter. Uh, yeah. Well, I just wanna say thank you because um, that's a ton of really, really good stuff. And um, yeah, I'm super appreciative of all the work. Is there things that you found during the legislative session that like we as a party could be doing better to make your life easier because being a progressive in the state house is probably very isolating. <laughs> And so are there ways that like we've engaged this year that have been good? Are there things that like we could do better or things that didn't work, things like that? Oh, I really appreciate that question, Carter. And you know, I will say it wasn't as lonely this year. I know we have a reduced caucus in the house, um, had seven last year down to five. But really with this turnover and new folks, we've built some really strong connections with our, our Dem allies who are starting to understand and see how amazing the Progressive Caucus is um, and how uh, we don't whip votes by threatening, but instead we educate people as to what their votes actually mean on various bills and have brought more folks in to either consider being a progressive or to at least work with us as allies to kind of push up against the Dem establishment. So that has been amazing. 
where I've seen you all really turn out and show the force of the progressives is when it came to that election spill. Um, we would not have made the progress that we made if it was not for you all reaching out to your representatives, to your senators, and telling them exactly um, what you wanted to see. And I think that's where we can really build on the momentum in next year. Um, and I think where we can work together more collaboratively in the off session is seeing what progressive bills um, haven't had the movement yet. I know I was talking to someone as I came in and thinking about uh, universal primary care and how do we have 70 co-sponsors on this bill and yet it has not been taken up for consideration. Um, that is something we can take movement on and work together in the next session. So I think it's, uh, I want to give a major shout out as well to Sarah, our uh, legislative assistant for this past year. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Sarah has done just a phenomenal job in communicating out to you all via email, via our social media, and making sure that our work is out there. Because I will say that it's one of the most challenging pieces in being a small caucus, is making sure that we're communicating to you all all the work that we're doing. Um, I think there is a lot that happens behind the scenes that doesn't get captured, but I think Sarah has really helped us in making sure that we can get that information out to you in a, a better and easier digestible way. So here at your heart. So um, I'm Pat, Pat Troxell, live in Williston, and, um, and um, I want to talk to you about teachers a little bit because I was a special educator for 37 years, 30 of them at Williston Central School. And, um, and I just um, like don't want people to think that teachers are like not taking care of their, their students, you know, like, and, and it's, it's a crazy job because like, well, at least in Williston, you've got the, you know, parents who have tons of money and then also parents who's, you know, are going to the food shelf for, for, for their food. So, um, I don't know, I just want us to be easy on the, the teacher thing. Any teacher I know is doing the best that they can. Oh, by no, I really appreciate you bringing that up. And by no means do I want to discredit the work that our teachers are doing, especially uh, the way that they're caring and addressing the mental health crisis for our youth right now. Um, merely my critique was on our end of legislation and creating those disparities between teachers and students so that we, yes, teachers of course deserve robust protections, which is why we did not want to stall or delay this bill, um, but recognizing that our students as well uh, deserve that protection. And I think it really built on a, a larger conversation when we were looking at independent schools earlier in our legislative session. And folks uh, talked a lot about discrimination in independent schools, but failed to recognize that this is happening for our students across, whether they're in public, private, uh, the various sectors, and that there is more that we need to be doing so it doesn't fall onto the shoulders of just the teachers right now. Yeah. Thanks. Erhard. Thanks. I'll just join. You know, for Carter and everyone for thanking you for um, the amazing work that um, you guys are you guys are doing. Um, quick, just question about S100. <clears throat> Was there anything in S100 that uh, is going to help prevent uh, kind of NIMBY appeals uh, at the local zoning level? You mentioned Lamoille County uh, earlier. Um, they, the shelter and Lamoille Housing Partnership, there are just trying to stand up like the first permanent. Um, uh, transitional housing and, and shelter and it was just a, they have all the funding in place they got plans they're taking over uh, you know an old um, can't remember I think it's uh, it's an old building that's you know no longer um, serving its you know its former purpose and it just got appealed um, and they're involved in a whole like appeal appeals battle um, so I'm just wondering if there was anything in, in not to get totally into the weeds but um, was there anything in S100 that helps prevent those kinds of um, appeals? Absolutely, um, especially when we look at emergency shelters. That was the amendment that we put forward um, in really changing the effective date for the municipal bylaws and having zoning in place for emergency shelters and not being able to appeal or put impediments because of the character of the area or what hours of operation they were going to have or what services they would provide. Um, so again, sadly that's going into effect in September and not July 1st, um, but much better than December 1st. But general for appeals, 
Um, I will have to get back to you in other sectors, but I do know about the emergency shelter provision. And one more here. Um, uh, Travin uh, Callis, um, and I'm, I'm active with the Vermont AF AFL-CIO and DSA. I'm, I'm wondering what your assessment is of the future of the uh, Vermont PRO Act, which I was really pleased uh, passed out of the Senate. Um, but the business interests in this state are now quite aware of it, and um, we expect serious pushback from, from capital. Um, what do you think is necessary to get that actually passed? in a non-weakened form next year? I, I really appreciate the question. And I would say, I think, again, similar to the elections bill, it's really coming out and showing that the constituencies are behind uh, the PRO Act. Um, and that legislators need to know that this is a priority for our employees across the state. Um, I have my reservations with the committee that it is going into in general and housing and the movement that, or the lack of movement we've seen out of that committee. So I think any pressure that we can apply to make sure that this is taken up beyond what we are already doing in the House um, would be exceptionally helpful. But I am hopeful that it will move forward. Um, Liz, I'm being cut off on questions, but luckily I sit right next to you and can answer them. Um, and I'm going to pass over to David and Mark. Uh, Josie might be able to answer questions. Uh, thank you, Taylor. And I just want to give a kudos. The House Caucus of Five, really with the coalition that they've built with a number of those newer Democrats who've come in over the last two election cycles, have really broadened the, the voice. And I think the budget scenario right now is a prime example of that, where uh, I alluded to earlier with you know Dean and Terry and some of those early years, we could get some Democrats to vote for floor amendments on issues and we'd get to 17 or 32 amendments. And so it would show that there was a broader issue of support around a labor bill or health care and so forth. But when it came to the critical vote that was going to make the difference on a law passing or not, or a sustaining of a veto of the governor around a critical economic justice issue, which houselessness is sort of fundamentally rooted in that, um, they would never, ever come along. So that's some of that dynamic shift that's happened over the 25 years. And uh, Taylor and Emma and the House Caucus have really done a phenomenal job with uh, harnessing that energy and collaborating with that energy in a way that I think is really promising and also has shown results. Um, I wanted to add on a couple different topics. I mean, I think one of the big areas with harm reduction and opioids um, there's been improvements, but some of the things I heard from some of the folks in, in Burlington anyway uh, is that a lot of times the hub part of the hub and spoke system is still really inaccessible to a lot of people. Uh, and what that is is that that's the first part where you've got to get the prescription from a doctor after a multiple hour kind of process. And a lot of times folks who are struggling with substance abuse disorder can't um, either meet the window of time that it's open, I think, for instance, at, um, uh, at what's the place in Burlington, the biggest one in the state? Um, mental health. No, uh, Howard, of course. Uh, Howard Center. Uh, it's like a four hour window. Um, maybe it's five hours, and then the, the doctors all go off to do other things. And so if you aren't you know, sort of getting the support you need to be there in that window, you can't get into the hub and spoke system. And then even when you do, at first, you've got to go back every single day in person. You can't get multiple days worth of medically assisted treatment so you can go about your life in a uh, less uh, impacted way. And so there's a lot of hurdles there that are policy hurdles that still aren't getting quite as addressed as they should be to make these hurdles much lower or non-existent. Uh, and that has to do with the uh, head of the Department of Health and so forth. Um, but those are some areas on that. Uh, Taylor touched on so many of these other issues. I'm going to skip over most of them. One of them, um, I will go into more detail, is elections reform. I just want to remind people that in other states across the country, I think Vermonters and others all over the place are aghast at what supermajorities are doing to restrict voter access to the polls, or to a range of candidates, and to participation. And what we have right now is the first supermajority party in the state, and as long as I can remember. And what did they do? They tried to push through an elections bill. 
with only votes from that one party. And even at that, they had to twist a lot of arms just to get the votes to get it to pass. And again, thankfully, many within the party have also said, wait, those measures are too far. Those measures are not democratic. Those measures are not broadening democracy. They're narrowing democracy. Now, is the scale or the um, severity as uh, inflammatory as we're seeing in other states? No. But the fundamental issue is that a supermajority is trying to change election law single-handedly without multipartisan or bipartisan or independent support to narrow power in politics. And that's the base of what's wrong with the elections bill. Yes, incredible work was done. And thank you, Taylor and Emma. Um, I talked to some House members. This is the one bill I testified on. You might, you know, it wasn't in anybody's radar screen until the media covered the fact that they were putting in this bill to eliminate fusion, to then force fusion a certain way, and then eventually finally take that out, to raise campaign spending, uh, campaign donations. Their original proposal was statewide candidates would then be able to give unlimited money to their party. Currently, anybody in this room can give $10,000 to a party. If you've got $10,000, the progressive party can be able to use it. But um, I wasn't even asked to give that pitch, but what the heck. Um, but, but, uh, but what they wanted to do is if you're a statewide party official, you got special rules to be able to give unlimited amounts of money. So that would really reward either people that can raise a huge amount of money or people who independently have a ton of money go, hey, let's get that person to run because then they could fund the party with $100,000. And as Taylor said, uh, in the compromise that was, was led by House progressives with, again, this cohort, uh, they got that reduced um, from what came out of the committee at 100 to an amendment that made it 60, and then in the Senate, it's been reduced to 20. Um, but, you know, this is about more money in politics? When most people are thinking, oh, we're sick of politics being party-driven and too much money. Um, the other pieces of the elections bill that were just poison pills is, again, that sore loser provision, which I and many others, uh, so the way it was worded was extremely hard to comprehend, did think, and I, I'm going to slightly adjust your comment, if you don't mind, um, because the floor fight was happening in the Senate. And um, I will admit, I was a part outside of the Senate job of being moderator of the Senate, where I'm neutral, talking to individual senators who were really concerned that what they asked progressives to do after Dean Corrin and Steve Hinchin and Marvin Malek and Cassandra Geekus and probably another person I'm not remembering all ran for lieutenant governor. Some of those, and of course, Anthony, you know, at that point running three way races, they said, don't run three way races, run in our primary. And I'm giving you this history because these are important things for you to know when you have these conversations in the community. And progressives, such as myself, Taylor, and so many others, we run in the Democratic primary to avoid three-way races because the election system is, is prohibitive to multi-way races. That's why we're pushing for ranked choice voting and other changes. Because we've done that and been successful, they were like, darn it, we wanted to run in our primary and lose. And so now, because progressives have won, including my last race for lieutenant governor in that primary, they were very, very convinced that was the end of a progressive statewide office. Um, that is what this retaliation and retribution is about in this bill. It's completely from the top of the House. Uh, that was overheard on the floor of the Senate, if I'm not mistaken. And so they've, they've tried to say, now you either couldn't run fusion, which a third of all elected people in the state run fusion candidates now. Then they tried to make it where they said, well, whichever party you uh, primary you file your petitions in, which in Vermont you're limited to only filing in one, they could change that and open up politics more. Uh, and I know, again, this is detail, but fundamentally, housing, environment, equality, all of that is determined by who's elected. It all boils down to election law. That's why I'm going into this detail. So they, um, they, they, their second version was, OK, if you run in a party's primary by petition, you are automatically forced to run with that as your primary label in the general election, which would have made all of us who do this Democrats slash progressives, which would have by default eliminated the existence of the progressive party as a major party. That, it's important to know these details. Most people out there don't know them. They won't care unless they realize how it's changing democracy away from what we've created in Vermont, which is the most diverse electoral representation by party and independents anywhere in the country. 
the only one. And they're trying to change that. But the sore loser provision sounds innocuous, but it is deeply critical. Because if they have that provision go into law, which says if you file a petition in a primary and you lose it, another party uh, caucus cannot nominate you for that office. What that means is progressives will have to make a choice. Do you run in a primary where, either, where the district committee can heavily put their thumb on the scale and make it so that you lose, which has happened a couple times, and those are the two times progressives have then run outside in the three-way race. Susan Hatch Davis and um, Marcy uh, Young. Young. And those two times in the last eight or 10 years is what they're supposedly so upset about. But that was because the playing field was not level in the primary. If they make it so that you cannot be nominated afterwards, after the primary, by another party, that gives them free reign to put their thumb on the scale at the district level, whether it's House, Senate, or statewide, to make it impossible for a progressive to run collaboratively as we do to avoid three-way races. So what's that lead to? Progressive has to decide. Do I run in an incredibly unlevel playing field, which we already don't get NGP van, but we, we're okay with that because our lists are actually better. Um, or two, do we run three-way races? Over two or three election cycles, you can imagine that if 10 or 15 progressives run three-way races for the House or the Senate, and half to two-thirds of those end up being won by a Republican, it will only take two or three two-year cycles for the story to be, if you vote for the progressive, if you vote for Ralph Nader, if you vote for, if you name the name, they're the spoiler, don't do it. And you know the average voter is going to go, it's not worth the risk. That's why that provision is so uh, insidious, because it sounds pretty innocuous, but it's actually a two to six year elimination of choice. And the final piece I want to say on that, which is the correction, is I was under the impression that if you won a write-in on another primary, you were also prohibited, which technically you are not. So if you win a primary that you're on the ballot, and you win a write-in on the progressive, you would still be able to run that three-way race uh, if you lost the, the Democratic primary. Um, but that creates even more strategy, especially because of the whole write-in provision that was changed, where now you either need to beat someone else in the write-in, or you have to get the number of write-in votes as you needed petition signatures. So for statewide, you would need to get 500 if there was no one on the ballot. For a Senate seat, I believe it's 100. For a House seat, it's 50. That doesn't sound like much, but if you look at how many races are decided in the primaries by that number or fewer, you then have to calculate how many of my voters do I want to say, please take the progressive ballot to write me in because they're, they're putting the finger on the scale. It's already going to be close, and now I've got to divert votes to win two primaries. So way too much detail, except that that is the foundation of the existence of this party. And I have a couple other issues, but clearly there's some election questions. So, Liz, yeah, and then. Uh, well, uh, thanks. Wow, that was great. Um, and I did uh, <laughs> well, put pressure on my two state senators who were on the uh, committee, Democrats. Um, what the, the Democrats nationwide are always yelling about voter suppression. Well, to me, we should bill this as voter suppression because that is exactly what it is. So I think we ought to figure out a way. Well, I would certainly say if anybody in this room wants to work on an op-ed for Digger to really spell this out, I don't think it's ideal if it comes from Taylor or me. Yeah. Now that it's on Orca, I'm kind of screwed. But anyway, um, uh, we, we could work on this because I do think it's going to continue. And the thing about the election law is they're really mad because we delayed it enough and we had enough support from the, the Democrats who ran saying, no one talked to me about how bad fusion was. They talked to me about housing. They talked to me about you know, food on the table. They talked about opioid. They talked about health care. Um, that group helped make it so they couldn't suspend the rules to speed the bill along. So it hasn't actually gotten out of the Senate yet. 
Um, both sides, it's limped through. The final vote in the Senate, not the final vote, but the last vote was 16-14. Literally one more vote would have been a tie. Um, but the veto session is going to add a couple days to the process. And if some of the bills take a few extra days, it could work its way into the House and get passed. The governor will probably veto it because they added ranked choice voting to it, but it's not really ranked choice voting, it's basically a study. So the idea is sore loser law in exchange for a study of something that might happen someday down the line when we're already gone. Uh, but if you want to work on an op-ed, that's great. I know I'm getting the hook, but I'm going to override that for a couple more minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so with this bill, would the state committee still be allowed to like, give someone the endorsement like this? If, no, if you didn't, it, it could give someone an endorsement. But if the candidate loses a major party primary for which they have filed, the party committee cannot nominate that person for that office in the general election, if this provision is through. And then another question I had was um, 20, sorry, 2018, I was like looking through Ballotpedia, and I saw that uh, uh, Anthony Kleena had ran in the Prague primary and got like over 4,000 votes. Did something change between 2018 and recently that like incentivized you to do the, um, like going into the Dem primary instead of running the- I don't remember that he got 4,000 votes in the that's, Prague primary. That's, that's what it says no. on Ballotpedia. That, so well, that's I don't think, I'm looking around other people. I, I think the most anybody's gotten who's been actively trying to do it was four years, th three years ago when I was running for governor and I had to be Chris Erickson and I beat her by like five votes yeah. when we calculated like what we needed versus what, and I almost lost, they didn't count the ones from Paulette or down in Middletown Springs, and we had to open the thing. So I don't think that's accurate. But, um, so the, the, I, I have to get off, but I wanted to mention briefly, very briefly, two other things. One is I am planning this summer to do two sets of uh, events. One is some town halls around sort of rural economy or seniors issues in, a, in a five or six places around the state. Um, and Martha and I are working on putting that together. The other is um, a, a book reading tour at libraries sponsored by local bookstores uh, around banned books. And so I put up a, a shelf outside my office at the State House with you know, banned books or books worth reading. Uh, I think this, this is a broad appeal issue from big government telling you what you can read or not read or access to. It is a, a, a critical issue, obviously, with respect to suppressing racial history as well as gender and, and life identity. So both of those arenas are highly, highly impacted in the book banning. Uh, I think it ties into some of the national narrative and it's a bit of pushback to what's happening in school districts and places in other parts of the country. Um, and, and it's a First Amendment issue. And so it, it reaches a pretty broad audience of awareness. I don't know that many people in Vermont who are going, oh, this book banning thing is going really well. We should think about that. And so I think as we as progressives are trying to reach across the state to broad audiences, we really need to think about those issues that we bring straight up front and foremost that can bring in the broadest audience. And I'm not saying that's necessarily it either, it's one of them, but the, this universal primary care bill is one that I think is critical. The housing issues are critical. Chris and I were just talking about the short-term rentals and the Airbnb. We can build all the housing in the world we want. If it's bought up by investors who are gonna rent it out as short-term rentals, it's gonna do jack diddly for actual affordable housing for working class people or the missing middle housing. Uh, and that's the place we're in in Vermont right now. Uh, Martha loves reminding me to use this phrase, we are a playground for the rich and everyday people here cannot afford to stay here. And if we built right now the housing supply demand, pure capitalism, so out of whack, if we had 500 more housing units built next year uh, that were supposedly to help our economy out and everyday folks, the vast majority of those houses are going to be priced right out of range of any everyday person working a 16, 18, 22, $25 an hour job. And unless we do a rental registry and we make those folks who are doing short-term rentals either consider them commercial, as Chris and I were just talking about, and pay a commercial rate of property taxes, and or Earhart and I, we've been out on the, on the Homeless Awareness Day for probably a couple decades saying we need a hotel and rooms tax 
that is 90% paid by out-of-staters to go into a long-term, every year, annual affordable housing funding to make these developments possible with permanent affordability provisions. These are the kinds of things that if we were, if we were out there pounding the pavement on, they're gonna resonate really, really broadly. Uh, and I know we were trying quite a bit when I say we, I'm speaking for legislators that I'm not, so I'm really going beyond the we. They have been working on is that affordability within the housing provisions. Um, and there's, there's a lot more to go there, and it takes money. And that's the big fundamental difference that I want to talk to people between liberals and progressives. Liberals want to do a lot of good things as long as they don't cost a lot of money. And progressives are saying we have an economic system that is fundamentally out of whack. We need to shift that, whether it's through raising minimum wage, universal health care, raising taxes on the wealthy, to fund the things that will make an economic just society. That is the fundamental thing that I believe distinguishes progressives from liberals. Martha, and then I gotta stop because I'm really sure the hook is already like new programs. Very quickly, I want to thank Taylor for being concise and articulate and yeah. covering all that ground. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, so I have to go into too much detail. <laughs> I, also, I also want to point out that the um, Progressive Legislative Caucus in both the House and Senate has a real challenge now because they are all from Chittenden County. And so they now have to broaden their representation and be the progressive legislators representing all of rural Vermont because there's nobody like Cindy Weed or Anthony Polina in there to, to do that. And I was really pleased to hear you talk about leveling the playing field for home daycares because home daycares around the state are what's out there in rural areas for folks. And so I'm really happy to hear that you guys we're really thinking about that. And um, I would just urge people in this room who are largely not from Chittenden County to be sure and give these guys information that they need that they can use to help represent us. Because I know they would love to do that, but they're not necessarily in touch with the whole rest of the state. So thank you. Um, I really appreciate that point, Martha, and we do try our best to be uh, have that statewide focus, but it is difficult having all of us be in uh, Burlington and then me just outside of Burlington. Um, oh, yes, and Tanya, just even further outside of Burlington. So um, one thing I will highlight is that the coalition that we're building is still very inclusive of our either former DPs or PDs. So especially when it came to the budget and other uh, discussions, Heather Serpernant has still been very much involved with the caucus and highlighting issues for us and also being on our team. She was one of the folks who flipped and voted against the budget, of course voted against the elections bill as well. Um, and Molly Burke uh, has been involved in the process, uh, sadly, to support the budget overall. Um, but we have uh, maintained those connections and really saying that um, we're not an exclusive club. We are trying as uh, best we can to bring everyone in, whether they are allies on specific issues or across the board. Um, just wanted to highlight that. Thank you, Taylor. Thank, Thank you, David. Um, they're doing amazing work. But also, you know, um, yeah. Yeah, they've been absolutely crushing it. And also, Tanya Vyhovsky, I just want to say, has been doing incredible work on the elections bill. Um, you know, she's huge. You, both, both Taylor, both Tanya and David, I think, worked hand in hand to really deliver the votes that we needed to both stall and then I think probably we killed it. Um, I think it's more likely than not it's dead at this point, which is great. Um, and then, yeah, I also just wanted to give a shout out one more time to our legislative staffer, Sarah. Sarah has gone like above and beyond, time and time again. Um, you know, often friends are like working, she, she's only half time and often does like more hours than she's been allocated. Um, and does stuff not even just within her role, but volunteers regularly to do kind of elections work and organizing work and has just been a huge asset. So she's taking a leave of absence for the next two months and then may come back. I think we're still, she's still deciding if she's gonna come back after that um, as an organizer, so. If anyone here can give 10,000 to the party, yeah. I'm gonna help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, thank you, Sarah. You've been, you've been absolutely incredible. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, 
Yeah, so the next the next piece of the agenda, we're gonna move through, try to move through the update portions because we're like way, way over and we haven't told one. Um, so we're gonna try to move through some of the other pieces like really quickly. Um, this is a housing related resolution that Will Anderson, one of the new members of our COCO, drafted um, in support from with Sarah. I think the House Caucus also had taken a look and made some um, suggestions on it, I think. Um, I could be wrong on that. Um, and we were hoping to kind of vote on this today um, as you heard recently, like this is kind of the major fight right now um, over the motel voucher program. Um, there are some communications in the back from the party and from the House Progressive Caucus on the um, on the motel voucher program. So we're hoping that we can take a vote on this and then put it out as a formal statement from the state committee. Um, and I'm just going to read it real quick, and then. Um, if folks want to discuss like briefly, um, and then I'm hoping someone can move, you know, move and second um, for a vote on this, and then we can actually take a vote. Um, so I'm just going to read through it right now. Um, so the this, this statement says, the Vermont Progressive Party stands against the current iteration of the state budget for fiscal year 2024. A core principle of our platform is that housing is a human right. The current version of the budget would take that away from thousands of homeless Vermonters, pushing them out of temporary housing and onto the streets by removing support currently provided by the General Assistance Program. As it stands, the version of H-494 that sits on Governor Phil Scott's desk would dramatically ramp down the state's housing program for our most vulnerable residents. By the end of July, roughly 3,000 Vermonters will be left without a place to live and forced to seek out already critically limited shelter placements sleep on streets or in parks. This can translate into increased rates of incarceration and hospitalization and will create costs far greater than those required to increase Vermont's supply of state-owned temporary housing. What we are faced with now is a symptom of the long-term failure to prioritize real solutions to the housing crisis. For decades, the legislature has kicked the can down the road while burning money in the process on unpopular temporary hotel lodging band-aids that provide ready fodder for our opponents who can easily point to the poor optics and wastefulness of such an approach. We are immensely disappointed in the administration and General Assembly, Assembly in their failure to create a humane transition out of the emergency housing program into long-term supported housing. With Democrats and progressives having a super majority in the General Assembly, no one should be coerced into voting for legislation that does not align with their values. Furthermore, giving to such pressure with thousands of lives on the line should not be an option, but here we are. We can simultaneously invest in housing for the future while continuing to shelter those that currently rely on our support. Our party representatives will not support any budget that leaves out thousands of people who they are elected to represent, and our party membership holds strong in our belief that housing is a human right. We strive to set a higher standard that prioritizes dignity and safety for all. Well, let's 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 open it for a discussion very quick that's that's okay um, I see David has his hands up hand up uh, just real quickly um, I certainly think the party this is a great statement overall and I'm not a representative who would be voting and I believe at the moment all five would be voting no but for the party to tell the world what the legislators are going to do with their vote is slightly potentially constraining. I don't know if we're that's voting, okay with you. Yeah, we're all voting against the budget if it doesn't include a just transition. So, right. And we've already made that, that uh, public. Right. So you're okay with this, even if at some point there's some nebulous area there where you are on the edge of doing it one way or the other. Okay. Yep. All right. Just wanted to double check. Okay. Any, anything else? Any other conversation? Okay. Earhart. Um, this is, I think, overall a great statement. The one thing that struck me as somebody who worked, you know, pretty much my entire career in housing and spent many years defending this program as a uh, legislative lobbyist for the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition, I just want to um, just caution folks from calling the emergency housing program an unpopular program. Uh, it is in some quarters. Um, but it, and it is only a Band-Aid, but it is what has kept people safe during the pandemic and before. Uh, it is what's kept people safe that are unhoused in the winter, 
uh, you know, during during our, our harsh winters, and it has prevented um, a much greater loss of life among uh, Vermont's homeless population over you know over over not just the last three years, but even before that, because it's it's been around for many many years. So I just want to caution. Uh, I'm not going to you know wordsmith or you know ask ask for any kind of changes in the wording, but I just want to caution folks um, from kind of adding into the, um, I think, the narrative that Digger and other um, uh, outlets have, have and, and some politicians have uh, created that this is an unpopular program because it, it, is, it is literally life-saving. I mean, we could, wait, sorry. Yeah, so I would just, yeah, Sarah, well, I, and I would say I could just delete that word unpopular. I would think that there's nothing you know, fundamental about that word that needs to be in the statement. Was that what you were gonna? Well, I was so gonna say, we could just cut out that sentence. Yeah. Like, I feel like maybe. Yeah, or, could, I don't even think we need to cut out the sentence. I think we can just say. The legislature has kicked the can down the road. Yeah, we yeah I think everything else in that statement. Don't start oh, editing the thing. We'll be here for the rest of the day. But, <laughs> yeah, I, I am comfortable doing that one minor change without getting too far into any of the details, and then Trey, and then I would hope we could move to a vote after that because we are way over. I was going to recommend replacing unpopular with inefficient because I, I think that that is, I mean, it is popular, it is life saving, but the, taking the can down the road and the solution that they have put up for a while is something that they can purposefully say, this sucks and we need to get rid of it instead of putting forward a very solid, permanent plan of calling it inefficient instead of unpopular. But, yeah, I think that could, that could be fine, Taylor. Uh, my recommendation would just be to take out uh, the word that's already been taken out. Um, recognizing that the general assistance uh, emergency housing program is, is not going anywhere. I think that's the common misconception yeah. is that we are getting rid of this program and that it is ending permanently. What's ending are the COVID era rules around this program, but it is still very much a safety net for anyone who is experiencing homelessness and has been in the state uh, program for quite quite some time th th thanks for that i was going to say that as well <laughs> it's, yeah um, it, it, it was just yeah because of fema funding from the federal <laughs> government basically um it was able to provide shelter to a lot of folks who were doubled up in uh couch surfing and living with family and friends prior to the pandemic so that they would have a safe place to shelter uh, and isolate okay yeah i mean i think i think that's fine so let's do i hear do i hear a motion See Carter. What motion would I make to get us to a vote? <laughs> so I, I think you would vote to move the statement um, as as a statement of the Progressive State Committee. As as, as amended. As amended, yeah, as amended. I think you just made that motion. So I just yeah. made that motion. Okay. And then second. I see a second from Liz, Liz Lum. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed. Looks like the eyes had it, so it has been so moved. Good work. Um, so yeah, we'll work to get that out soon. Um, early next week, I think, or early this week. Um, so yeah, we're gonna move through the next few agenda items in, in rapid succession, I hope. Um, so we have a financial update, and then a fundraising report, and then a communications committee report. So I'm hoping we can get through the next three of these items in maybe like five to 10 minutes. Um, and yeah, so Robert, do you want to do a quick financial report? We have attached the um, Rob, Robert's written report to the back of your agenda. So um, if you want to add anything, that would be the time. Uh, I can keep it really quick. The finances are good. Does anybody <laughs> <laughs> but we could always use more money as Dan So uh, that's where the envelopes. The, there's envelopes up there. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. and we'll, we'll, the we'll definitely have a we'll definitely have an ask. We'll and our next update is fundraising. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Robert's doing yeah, a thanks, great Robert. job. Thanks, Robert. Robert's been extremely helpful and sending these monthly reports um, to us, so thank you for that. <laughs> so um, the next piece is um, fundraising, report and reach budget. Um, we're not gonna go over the reach budget, we just shared that with the coordinating committee. So essentially, um, 
and we, we have a fundraising committee that's been meeting every other week and now every week in preparation of this June 3rd fundraising event. Um, and if you're on the fundraising committee, if you want to stand up real quick, that would be amazing. So thank, thanks everyone. So Matt, Matt Cox has been sharing and then Cardin Newbiezer and Mariel Lai have all been doing incredible work. Um, so what's going on with this event? So Ben Cohen and Jerry Greenfield of Ben and Jerry's um, have made a really generous offer to match up to $10,000 each um, money raised at an event that we're hosting on June 3rd. And this event is geared towards, um, this was their idea um, that they kind of worked with us on. Um, the idea is that there's all this money, all these kind of wealthy progressive donors, and many of them are giving way under what they could. So they're working with us to identify the kind of high capacity donors bring them to this event on David Zuckerman's farm. So thank you, David, for allowing us to host. Um, and um, try to get, get them to go above and beyond what they've done in the past. Um, so this has been a really good process. Um, the fundraising committee has been meeting regularly. It's been really fun to work with them. Um, I think just in pledges, we're somewhere around 13,000 um, in, in pledges for this event. Um, so we're hoping we can bring in another, you know, seven, seven or so, um, seven or eight before the actual event on June 3rd. Um, and I think there's still a few potential large donors that we can reach out to um, to kind of get us there. And also, if any of you, so the, the kind of criteria that we had um, discussed with Ben and Jerry is really people who can afford to give like 500 or more um, for the event. Um, so it's like the higher capacity folks. Um, and that's, that's who we're kind of reaching out to for this. Um, but if any of you know anyone, or you yourself, would be willing to write a $500 check and want to join, let me know. Um, and that will help us get, get to the event um, and reach, reach our fundraising goal. So that, what that would do is that would essentially add $40,000 to our budget. Um, and by comparison, our current budget is only about $90,000. Um, we, we only spend about 90000 each year, which is more than we've had in the past. It used to be closer to like $70,000. Um, so this would be a really, really huge step forward for the party. Um, it would allow us to expand our second stop person, currently Sarah's hours, to, um, to either two-thirds or even full-time. Um, it would allow us to fund more events, um, you know, and really do all the things that a party should be doing to um, build out our capacity statewide. So this is a really exciting opportunity and we're really focused on it for the next few weeks. Um, and I would love to get ideas from folks if you have, have ideas on people who can do um, a significant check or would like to join, um, please let me know. And um, we're also going to be planning a um, grassroots fundraiser for um, later in late July, early August. Um, so that's, we're not just reaching out to the really big donors, this is kind of something new that we're doing. Um, we usually do a grassroots fundraiser and we will be doing that again um, because we know that the, the base of our support really comes from the people who are doing 5, 10, 15 bucks a month. Um, and you know, that's what's allowed us to be sustainable and sustain ourselves. Um, so we are going to be doing that as well. Um, and I really appreciate everyone who's been able to donate. I know probably most of you are monthly donors already. Um, if you are not currently currently a monthly donor, we do have donation envelopes, and maybe um, does someone want to go around, go around and pa pass those down as we as we always do? Um, okay, okay, good, 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 good. Yeah, yeah. So that's 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 perfect. Um, yeah. So you know, events like this cost a few hundred bucks. Um, so it's great when we can. Um, you know, raise the money even to just fund the event at a meeting like this. So anything you can do is really helpful. And um, slowly through this work, we are in a stronger and stronger financial position every year, and that's great. Um, so with that, yeah, I'm going to move move right on through. Um, so that's our fundraising and reach budget, and then um, we're going to talk about the communications committee very quickly. Um, so this is another new committee that. We've, um, we've started with the Progressive Party. Uh, and folks are active in the Communications Committee. Do you want to stand up real quick? I think it's just Sarah, maybe. Sorry, I expected more people to stand up. Can we all stand? 
Well, you're all communicators for the Progressive Party, so everyone can, can view themselves in that role as well. Um, yeah, so the Communications Committee, we meet every uh, Monday at 11 a.m. and plan out our kind of weekly communication strategy. Um, and it's been really exciting, um, partially because of our new staff capacity um, and new people stepping up uh, into these roles. We've been able to do really a lot more on the communications front. And I actually um, printed out some the most recent communications that we've um, sent out in the back. And maybe some of you have grabbed that. Um, so we essentially have, um, three major party updates at this point. So we have a legislative update that's been going out weekly that Sarah works with our House Progressive Caucus on. Um, and that's um, just really intended to update folks on like an issue or issues on a weekly basis that are moving their way through the legislature. Um, and that's kind of um, focused by the House, House Progressive Caucus, um, works with Sarah on that to draft it. Um, then we have what we're calling like a broad a broad vision or a big idea update, and that's intended to really appeal to um, a mass like base of people um, and not get too into the weeds and not get too into the specifics. Um, so taking an idea like houselessness or housing is a right and really just writing a few paragraphs that have progressive messaging um, that will appeal to people who aren't closely reading Vermont Digger or following the legislature or don't understand like exactly what's going on with the state budget, but do support progressive ideas or could be convinced to support progressive ideas. Um, and then um, we have what I'm, I'm calling the, the progress report, and that's kind of our insider update, and that's really geared towards people who, um, it's only, only people who are donors, or people who are on a progressive committee, so all of you all should, or most of you all should be getting that. Um, and that's like kind of the longer update um, that really talks about um, all the work we're doing across, um, across the party and is intended to um, give people who really care about the party and the issues we're fighting for um, all the details on the things that we're doing on a week-to-week -week basis. So that's, that's the idea of that. And we're also kind of putting in more um, stronger progressive messaging and um, really trying to frame these issues within the broader context of the organizing work we're doing and applying it to like the kind of theory of change um, that we fight for within the party. So that's, um, that's the progress report. And um, I think it's been really great to see. We've been getting a lot of positive feedback and um, we've also been able to um, raise, raise money off of um, some of these emails that we're not even asking for money for, so that's been great as well. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna, the, ne the next agenda item is the bylaw revision. Um, I do wanna stop very briefly and see if there are any questions on the previous three items. I see Carter. that team, help guide us a little bit, pull people together, making sure we're meeting. It's super helpful and I think, you know, we have limited staff capacity, so if we want this party to run, we gotta all put five hours a week or whatever amount of time we have into helping um, do these regular tasks and we're like skill building through it. So, I don't know, even in the last couple months, I've learned a bunch and I've really appreciated being able to see progressives on a you know weekly basis and it's been great to get to know Mac. Um, <laughs> So thanks for, for doing that. Yeah. Yeah, Max's been doing a great job chairing um, the fundraising committee. So that's been great. Any anything else very quickly on any of the previous three? So it's the finance financial report, the fundraising report, and the communications committee report. Seeing none, we'll move on. So I want to introduce Elijah Bergman. Um, so Elijah has been um, well, he refused to be the chair of our bylaw change community committee, he's effectively been the chair, so we'll call him the convener of the, of the bylaw change committee. Um, so we've been meeting weekly for the past couple of months right, at this point and gone through the bylaws line by line. Um, we haven't updated the bylaws since I've been in this position in 2016, so it's been, I don't know when it was updated previously, but it's been a while. Um, so we've spent significant time going through line by line and soliciting feedback from our members and um, Elijah's having a legal background has a has been very helpful in going through the state law to see what's changed because there's actually pieces of our bylaws that are not in line with state law um, in going through that and um, we at this point have a 
document that Elijah's going to share. I'm going to pull it up on the big screen. Um, and if you want to uh, take just a few minutes yeah, and talk about that, that'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. So I know some, not everyone here. Um, technically, I'm actually, no, not technically, actually, I'm not a state committee member because. Uh, last time around, my daughter was born on the day that we were going to be doing the organizing and didn't get it up, you know, to do the uh, the county caucus and go up from Let's there. Let's start with your priorities. I, well, <laughs> to be fair, I told Josh to tell me when the Rutland County Caucus was just so we could get there, and he did. He dropped the ball, which I repeatedly reminded him. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, uh, but yes, as uh, Liz pointed out, uh, my parents were found, probably founders, Martha would know, of the party back, you know, 50 years ago, whatever. I grew up going to meetings and doing things. My dad is a current Burlington City Council uh, member, and my mom would be very upset if I didn't also know that she's an elected progressive word clerk. Uh, uh, for many years. For many years, yes. So, um, and then I am an attorney. Uh, if you don't deal with law, uh, just big level, uh, I'm a litigation attorney, so I go into courts and argue about all that. There's transactional attorneys who would actually be much better suited to this because they just write contracts, so that is not my, my strong suit. Um, so if there are errors in some of the stuff, if I didn't think through uh, certain changes, that is very possible. And so I would love it if there was people, you don't have to be an attorney, obviously, but it has that mind for internal consistency, uh, especially with you know, things that are capitalized, things that aren't, um, all that stuff. Please give us that feedback because that's just not, we, didn't, we weren't trying to do that. And you know, to be a, a professional looking uh, document, since we are a major party, that would be helpful. Um, all right, so I have just some general points with some of the bigger changes. Feel free to raise your hand and stop me. I think that that probably would be good. And then, uh, oh, sorry, also, Jackie and Mac were also on the committee, and they're here, and we can take notes. The idea is, I think the process would be, we'll take your feedback, we'll meet after this, and then somebody will give a presentation to the COCO and do, It'll be on my hands at that point, and you all can figure it out. But idea is, I think, is that we will get this potentially for a vote when at the, at the next state commit. So the idea is, this is the draft. We're taking feedback. There's an online form on our website um, where people can both view this um, through a link and also submit feedback. So we're going to spend the next couple of months um, just so letting this all out there. So yeah, I think um, Marielle might know the exact date. I don't have it off the top of my head. Sometime in the summer quarter. It, yeah. It's on the. It, it's all. It's all listed on the agenda. Okay. So, so but that's that's going to be the process here, and uh, we have gotten some. August nineteenth. Yep. August nineteenth. Okay. And we have gotten some feedback. We made the decision before this meeting that it would be too confusing to edit this red line and say, oh, some, we got some feedback, and so this is not the version that you've seen. Um, so just so you're aware of that. Overall, I think that uh, just it's a very confusing process our state has um, for organizing committees, but just at a basic level, you have a town, every two years, you have a town caucus. The town caucus immediately ends, and, and basically, for maybe all towns except for Burlington, your town caucus becomes your town committee and then you have a town meeting. So you have a caucus and then a meeting. And by law, they're meant to happen one after another, at least the initial meeting. From there, you elect representatives to the county caucus, and those create uh, member, or state committee members, and then you go to the state committee. There's also something called the, a convention, and so there could be convention delegates, and we'll get into this a uh, little bit later, but basically, your convention is for your party platform. At least that's the only thing that the statute defines. All right, um, so some of the work we did, and you'll see in the red line, was uh, clarifying some of the these meetings in this order and everything. Um, we didn't want to go into detail specifically about the initial, you know, the town caucus and town meeting. There's a lot of statutory laws about that. Josh is thinking that maybe that might have 
potentially be one of the changes that could be made in the next two years. And so we basically just say, go follow the statute, which is not, you know, it's a little annoying to have to go to like multiple places, but we didn't want there to be a conflict. Um, we had, there was kind of by implication, um, or maybe a vague reference to the ability to remove members from, from town, county, or state committee, or the COCO um, for bad conduct or any conduct. So we just kind of, rather than defining that people could only be removed for bad conduct or anything, we just said you'd have to have a majority, I think, um, or two thirds to remove somebody to keep it you know, more flexible, but also you don't like somebody and so you're gonna kick them off. Uh, the committee. Uh, we one of the big changes we made is that uh, currently the bylaws have basically a sex diversity clauses talking about women and men, uh, or I think one place it says female and male, and so we try to change that. And uh, Josh reached out to a few key stakeholders, and basically Burlington had gone through uh, the Burlington Steering Committee had gone through. Uh, some discussion and so what we basically try to track their language and and so yes as Martha is saying it's um, basically a person whose gender and race are other than that of a cisgendered white man is basically I think that we might use some you know slightly different words but that's basically it so the idea is no more than half people can be me like me <laughs> um, and and so we um, yeah if other people have questions feedback wants to improve it this is how Burlington did it a lot of us are not from Burlington feel free to give feedback on it and this isn't a hard and fast so it specifically says if possible so I think there's also an understanding that a lot of the town committees are like three people have been doing it for 20 years and um, we're not saying that those can't be the three people anymore, but I think the idea is to encourage folks to try to think about like, think about diversity, think about inclusion when they're having these meetings and bring in different voices who, you know, maybe haven't been part of the conversation previously, but it's not a, we understand that there's not, you know, it, it wouldn't be feasible to say, to make this like a hard and fast rule in every, every scenario. Right, and then one of the things that I had toyed around with, but I'm not, a constitutional lawyer, we probably have to get Franco involved to see if this is even legal, but trying to put more teeth on this, uh, I was thinking, you know, what if we had a situation, say, in the election for officers for COCO, right? And overall, we didn't reach that threshold. But with ranked choice voting or something, like you had the person who came in ju or just missed the cut, do they get to jump in line above somebody who was like me? Um, and so, you know, that's where I, my lawyer brain, you know, it dings and says, I don't know, maybe there's some equal protection violations there and, and discrimination. And so while I think it would be helpful to put some teeth on actually making uh, like real strides towards diversity and inclusion, um, I don't know, like, we don't need, a, you know, some litigation here alleging we're violating the 14th Amendment. Um, we uh, created something called an executive committee, which is basically just the officers of the COCO, or, and they're also, confusingly, the officers of the um, state committee. So the chair, the vice chair, the treasurer, vice treasurer, and secretary. Um, and so the idea is these people can act uh, in between COCO meetings if some need arises, whether there's you know a personnel matter that needs immediately handling or some news event, and but there's going to be a provision where it has to go you know be transmitted to the full COCO and uh, review provisions. Um, we also changed some of the language uh, to modernize for uh, storing records on the cloud. Right now, it basically says that the uh, secretary has to have all the files and be <laughs> ensure that they're passed on to their successor, which uh, is not, you know, best practices. So we're modernizing that. 
Um, we did some mm, other, some minor other things like tweak the number of days for notice, uh, noticing meetings for like a, a town meeting or the county caucus or some of the COCO stuff to be more in line with state law and allow um, some more flexibility there. Then we also, one of the rules or changes that I thought of um, was we have a provision here saying that meetings are run by Robert's rules. And I basically was suggesting, because this is really coming from me, and so you have, everybody will vote on it, but um, is eliminating that, but having a reference to due process and fairness with the idea that unless you're Terry Baricious or a very limited number of people, you don't know uh, Robert's rules. I think when I Googled it, there's like the, the slim down version is 200 pages and how many people have time to read 200 pages and so that's a barrier so right <laughs> so uh, yeah exactly so there's like one or two people who can control the process so instead what we said is there's going to be a parliamentarian everybody can you know we'll let the parliamentarian at the beginning if there's a dispute about process okay um, and then you can always have the majority, I think we have like a simple majority, you could overrule the parliamentarian if Jeremy or whoever it is makes a ruling we don't like. But trying to be transparent also, because you know, we do stuff in, and you know, how Carter said, how do I do this? And then we came up with a seconding and all this stuff. Like, we don't need to do a fake process, like a, a faux uh, Robert's rules. Um, so that's what that is for. Um, we added a section on executive, the executive director because we didn't have that in there. And so we tried to clarify uh, the powers, duties, uh, reporting of the, who the executive director reports to, the COCO, but day-to-day -day functions is with the chair and vice chair, I think. Um, and so and we, I think we slightly modified or expanded some of the COCO duties and responsibilities as well. The biggest change, which I saved for last, is significantly increasing the size of the COCO from 11 to 25 members. So, um, so this is a bit bigger one. So currently there are 11, there's the five officers and six at-large people. There are, as Josh mentioned before, there are five regional uh, me members um, who are not voting, and so we would make them voting members. And then we have um, taking uh, from the Vermont Democratic Party, they have a practice of letting the labor community, which is really three of the big unions, select, I think they have like, they give the party a list of people that they want to be on the COCO, or their, their equivalent of the COCO. And so we have that, I did a slight twist, which is still requiring that member that labor or the list of labor be um, on the state committee. So it's not like they can just take some random person that, and one that should encourage labor to, if they really know ahead of time who they want, that they can encourage and they could help start uh, us organizing our reorg to get the, their candidate or their candidates uh, on local committees. So that could be nice. But it's not, and I didn't spell this out because I didn't want to get in too much of the weeds, but in theory, these people could probably just, you, you don't have to, how do I say this? You can add, be added to a state committee or I think go through the whole process after the fact. It's not just like once, you, there's a one-time window every two years. And so if labor really had somebody that they wanted, that person was a good fit, they wanted to be on it, we can go through the steps of adding them. Oh, uh, I, before I get to the, the last one, um, our bylaws distributed or, or specified the number of delegates each county committee has to the state convention. So like Chittenden County had roughly 25%. I think they had 25 and, there, and when we added up there was like 111 uh, total members. And so um, that's actually not what state law requires. State law requires that it tracks the number number of, uh, what is it, votes for governor, for that, that party's candidate for governor. And 
So because we don't always have a candidate for governor, we added in some provisions like then you go to I think state gov uh, uh, lieutenant governor and we followed whatever the succession was. So we specified like I, I forget if it's secretary of state and then auditor, treasurer, whatever. Um, we also switched uh, the who are convention delegates. So right now under the um, the current bylaws, convention delegates, and remember these are the people voting on the party platform, are any members of any town or I think county committee. And so uh, we switched that to be just all members of the state committee. So it's, it's a narrower field, but at the same time, Effectively, the state committee meets at the same time as the state convention. It's one of those things where we have it back to back. So these, it, it's narrower, but I think effectively the same people are going to show up. And I think it's just trying to eliminate confusion. Like, state is state. You are a state representative. You're, you're dealing with the state delegates. And there's that. Um, I think, and then the... The, then we considered uh, going back with um, uh, like the labor having a dedicated BIPOC member to the COCO, um, but basically we didn't know, like so with labor there are three unions that basically we can pick. And so we thought about it with BIPOC, but we didn't know like other than NAACP, like what other racial justice organizations that would we reach out to. And because we have the new language about uh, half of people, half the COCO members being non-cis uh, white men, we thought maybe that would be enough, although we welcome feedback if there's people who have you know, enough discrete organizations around the state that they want to consider that, we certainly would. And then the, the last one was a, a request, I think it originally originated from Martha, for having um, members be selected um, coming from the House Caucus, the Senate Caucus, and the statewide elected officials. And so, and I'll take, <laughs> this would be mostly my, my strong feelings. I felt like, uh, I didn't think that it was a good idea to put each one of those getting their own person. So what the current version here says is all those three entities, call it all, people in those have to get together and then they get to select one member. Um, so the idea was, um, my understanding was part of this was dealing with communication and I fundamentally think it doesn't matter whether it's one person or three people, like if communication is a problem between the electeds and the COCO, like that needs to be worked on directly and, and adding more people won't matter. I also felt like uh, everybody remembers the 2016 superdelegate issue with the Dems and Bernie, right? And it kind of felt like that it whole issue all over again, where you have, a you know, we're a grassroots party, and having uh, our electeds try to choose the people who are controlling um, just felt like, I don't know, also I feel like VDP is very tightly controlled by a few people at the top, and so I didn't like that. Um, and also, these are people who are going to be, uh, they're not controlled by whatever the elected person wants, right? So, like, even if David got to a point, like, say, Lisa, or, you know, whoever, like, Lisa's still going to have her own thought process and going to make her own opinion. So, um, that was just my thought. I know Martha has different thoughts uh, on, you know, if we want to let her explain it. Her, her opinions on that, great. If other people have other things on what I've said, uh, we'll welcome all other feedback. Yeah, I, I would just add very quickly. So yeah, so now's the time, sorry, thanks. So yeah, now's the time, like this is this really the start of the process. Now this draft is out there publicly. Um, we're taking feedback now, we're taking feedback through the online forum. This committee is gonna be meeting over the next a um, couple of months to kind of refine the opinions, um, look at the opinions people are sending us and the feedback we're getting. 
um, and make further refinements to this proposal. And then a month before the August state meeting, um, we'll submit the final draft. And then at that point, they'll still be, you know, we're hoping, I think, to be inclusive of everyone's feedback, but also understanding that, you know, this is a democratic process and, you know, whatever the committee comes up with might still not be what, you know, some people in the party want, and that's okay. And then, um, we'll, so we'll perform the final draft and then people can look at that and if there's still things that they would like to see that are different than what's in the final draft, um, they can propose amendments um, to that draft and we can discuss it at that state meeting before a final vote. So um, this is really the start of the process. This shouldn't be seen as the end of the process. Um, and with that, let's see if people have discussion or questions or anything. Um, Carter. Well, thank you, because I think this is a really good process, um, and it's been well. Well, thank you. It's been <laughs> it's been a really good process, I think, and it's good to have these discussions. So I appreciate it. The one the one piece of feedback I had was, and I know you kind of spoke to it. I think having a representative from the labor community makes a lot of sense. I also think having a representative from. Um, the LGBTQ plus advocacy um, community, uh, BIPOC advocacy community, and also environmental advocacy community makes a lot of sense. And those are all harder. And so I guess I understand that. And I think maybe, um, I don't have a sp specific proposal, but I'd be interested in trying to figure out how we narrow those, right? Because like even within the environmental community, there are folks who, and are organizations that certainly don't take an intersectional view or movement view to reducing carbon emissions, for example. Um, and then there are those that do, and we're allies with all of them at different points. Um, so I don't know, it's just a tough problem, but I do think we should be working towards getting a position because, you know, we're ideally the party that brings together movement organizations and convenes them and is representative of of advocacy orgs on the left generally so um, that's my only big thing everything else makes sense to me I agree I tend to agree with you around one member from representing the elected community on the statewide level um, you know electeds or a grassroots party and can engage with membership and all of these folks and ideally have a good working relationship and are building trust over time with the entire state COCO. Um, I do think it makes sense to have one person who's really bringing their interests because it's a whole different role that they play and different perspective that they bring, um, which is really good. Um, but yeah, so those are my thoughts. Anyway, I'll pass it to the next person. Martha. Hi, everybody. I'm Martha Abbott. Um, I was chair of the party for 12 years. Emma Mulvaney Stanek was chair for the next four or five years after that. And during that whole time, there were many occasions when there was a lack of communication between the elected leadership of the party and the coordinating committee. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, one is everybody's really busy. Two is that there just are things that happen quickly and we do not have time to really communicate them all and some of them require some real perspective from from the different points of view there has always been a tension within the party between the uh, people who see our job as going as far in the extreme as we can to lead the state in a direction and the people who want to be uh, cognizant of public opinion and try to lead the majority of people in the state and our main goal really is to elect folks to office and we have done that we've done a great job of it um, but there's often a lot of tension between the people who are elected to office who actually have to go out and talk to the voters and get themselves elected and the people who are not doing that and who have some ideas about issues that they want to see move in a particular direction. That's, that's how it should be, right? And that tension is what creates a path forward that really has worked for this party and has made it grow and has made it be more successful. 
I kind of started this process because over those years of experience and watching that process happen and talking to Emma Mulvaney Stanek, who was the chair and had those issues and now is the Pro Progressive Caucus leader in the House and now has those issues from the other side, um, and talking with the Lieutenant Governor, who can speak for himself here, um, there were many occasions when something would pop up in the press that the elected folks didn't know about, hadn't heard about, somebody turned off my microphone, perhaps it was me. Oh, it's dead battery. Uh, says right I can speak, dead. I'll try to speak loud enough, let me know if I'm not. Um, so it occurred, it, it just seemed to me like it would be really helpful to the COCO, which I am currently on, and to the people in office if there could just be a designated communications person who could go to the COCO and represent their point of view. Because a lot of times we don't think through, the, we don't know exactly what's happening in the legislature and what the kind of tricky little maneuvers and alliances and coalition building and, and support are, are being garnered by doing what. And it's often true that you can get in the way of that. So um, I had proposed three members, one from the House Caucus, Progressive Caucus, one from the Senate Progressive Caucus, which used to be a few more, but now is one person, but hopefully will grow soon, um, and one from anybody who manages to get themselves elected statewide as a progressive to have the three of them, because they're all very different, and they have very different points of view and very different roles to each of them have a member on the COCO that would really facilitate the communication, especially if we're going to 21 members on the COCO from 11. It doesn't seem outrageous to me to have three, so that each of those sets of elected folks would have just a voice and just be able to communicate back and forth. Um, Taylor was here, and I don't know if she had to leave, but I, I was think Earhart is hoping she would weigh in on that. Somebody can go out in the hall and grab it. Say, Earhart, stop monopolizing. <laughs> I see David and Trey. Yeah. David. Oh, I also see Ken. Uh, so I would just add one piece to that, um, which is that the during this actual, this last year, this year of the session, um, there has been uh, positive and challenging, but also primarily good uh, tension between legislators and me as a statewide official. We have actually very different jobs. Uh, policymakers are different than uh, a person in the administration. Uh, also, as a statewide office holder, I would argue that um, given the current makeup of our House and Senate delegation, which is all from Chittenden County, which I also am, uh, but have an obligation as a statewide office holder both to have campaigned all over the state, will be holding town meetings all over the state, these book readings all over the state. There's a, there's a breadth of perspective there um, that is a little bit different maybe than the current caucus scales, uh, that maybe having two or three might not be a bad thing because we actually bring very different perspectives. I would also uh, echo what Martha said, which is there are times uh, where it's, it's minute by minute or hour by hour some of the decisions that are being made amongst different coalitions of the progressive House members with the House or the House and Senators together with various House and Senators. and um, So the nimbleness in that regard, policymakers just, just got to do what they got to do in the moment. There's no way the scale of bureaucracy of a, of a committee is going to equate to that. Um, but I would suggest, if possible, adding, making that three people instead of one. As Martha just said, going from 11 to 25. I don't think they're going to have an overwhelming, disproportionate, superdelegate power, um, but it is going to add uh, a perspective. And there's a difference in activism and governing. Uh, that is a tension that is really important that we all feel and, and experience, uh, which is trying to be activists in a governance process. But when I look back at what Bernie did in the 80s in Burlington, radically shifting how governance worked for everyday people. Um, that was bringing that activist perspective in, but it was still actually having to do the management to affect the policy, to affect people's lives on a day-to-day -day basis. And that is a little bit different than activism. 
So I've touched on it from a few different angles, but uh, that's my thoughts. And I did just want to point out, I think, um, yeah, it's actually 18. Um, I, I think that was, yeah, okay. that was a mis misstatement. Well, no, that, no, yeah. no, no, yeah, exactly. There we go. So yeah, it's we're growing from, I believe, 11, although in, in reality, with the regional advisors, it's currently um, um, 16, effectively 16. So we're basically adding two, five, five people from non-voting to voting, but they're already kind of on the COCO. And then two, this, this revision adds two kind of totally new positions. Um, so just, yeah, just to frame that as well. Um, but yeah, any other comments, Earhart? Well, was, I think, oh, I think I think you already had Ken was waiting. And, oh, yep, Ken. And if we wanted to get Taylor's perspective also. Yep. yep, for sure. So yeah, let's do maybe Ken and then Taylor, Earhart, and then I thought Trey had his hand up as well. <coughs> Ken, you're up. Yeah. Radically expanding the uh, size of the cocoa, is there any need for any language on quorum? That's what I was going to ask. I believe there's language already in the bylaws around quorum. Um, um, that would, it's just a, I think it's like 50% of them, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Um, it's half of members of the COCO are quorum, so I don't think we need to change any, any of that because it's just a percentage rather than a set number. Um, so whatever the new number would be, that quorum rule would still apply is my understanding. I think that, so I'm looking at our section 19 has quorum for, Although I doesn't, I don't think it specifies that it's for the COCO, but maybe it does. Um, and it says any number of members in attendance, mm -hmm. and we added either physical or virtual because we're understanding things are going to be hybrid or potentially virtual. Shall be a quorum, and then there's specific requirements for things like um, uh, where endorsements. It requires half, at least fifty percent of the committee members. Um. So we'll take a couple more, and then we do want to wrap up in just a minute because we want to spend significant time planning our summer organizing, um, and we have to be out at one. But if we want to take like one or two more questions with the understanding that, again, this is the start of this process, um, and then we're going to be moving forward, and people can still submit online, and there'll still be a chance. You know, The committee is doing really good work, and they're going to try to incorporate everything, and you know, we still may have disagreements, and then we'll just deal with it through the democratic process at the next meeting, and that's... That's actually really healthy. Um, but Taylor, I think, was next. Uh, thank you. I, I will merely acknowledge that uh, we have a small caucus um, of six across the House and Senate, um, and then one in statewide office. Um, so I do agree with David's point that I think we need to have folks at varying levels. We need someone who's in the executive branch, folks who are in the legislative branch, um, coming together and participating. I think my only amendment to what was said would be to reduce it to two representatives, one from a statewide official and then one that is serving the legislature, whether that be the House or the Senate. Because um, as it stands right now, we're essentially uh, forcing Tanya to be a part of the COCO, which I'm sure she would love to do. Um, but if we don't grow our numbers, then we're obligating legislators to do additional work on top of what's already in the session. So it wouldn't, um, just to clarify, it wouldn't be that you would be on the COCO, you could select somebody. Oh, so you could, you could select a friend. <laughs> you or, yeah. Yes, I would argue that I think the best legislative perspective are the folks who are in the building, um, but I think the original point still remains. Of, I think it should be someone appointed by the legislative uh, group as a whole, both House and Senate, and then one that is appointed by the executive. Um, do Earhart, Trey, and then I see a few more hands up. We'll try to move through very quickly because this is important, but then we are going to try to move to the organizing conversation. Trey Earhart? I had the same issue that Ken mentioned around quorum as you're expanding. Uh, did you guys, are you not worried about, um, you know, some meetings not being able to meet quorum? When the Burlington Steering Committee increased its size, uh, there were some concerns about that. And we actually uh, had a provision in our bylaws that basically said elected officials didn't count towards, uh, towards quorum. Um, which reduces, you know, the number that you need to uh, to meet quorum. So I don't know, you know, I'm not a regular attendee at COCO meetings. Uh, if there's no worry about that, um, fine. Uh, but if 
you're maybe concerned about 50 percent, you know, requirement for a higher number being an issue. Just from the Burlington perspective, I, I'd say you know um, you might think about uh, exempting elected officials um, from being part of that, counting towards that that quorum. Yeah, so um, I had a longer comment, but I'll try to trim it down. I think that we should put an article in there for a, a formal youth section. Uh, I got involved with organizing through the youth section of Democratic Socialists of America. Um, I think the party could really benefit from uh, actively recruiting a new generation of lifelong progressive organizers and bringing them into the fold. Uh, additionally, adding in language that would guarantee representation at uh, all the different committees where there are um, members. I have some language written up that I could share with uh, the bylaws group after, but uh, that's the number one note I have. Uh, additionally, with like the labor part and labor representation, um, I am the field organizer for the AFL-CIO, and they have gone out of their way to like really um, go all in on the procs. Like I've been in there for their endorsement conversations. They, you guys send a slate, and it says Progressive Party, and they're like, great, rubber stamp, it's done. And then they'll complain about the Dems and do whatever. Um, I think that the benefit of having representation from the labor movement is involving workers, not just you know, a list of officers, which personally I feel like some of the other uh, labor works outside of the AFL-CIO might just put on a list of their buddies. Um, I know that it, probably the way that this would look in practice is the AFL-CIO determines its list itself, but we could benefit from language that specifies that they are directly elected by union members. Um, you could use an online uh, platform like OpaVote, sending that out to uh, the list of all these membership unions, and then we know exactly who is uh, elected. Um, and if we you know, want to be a, a real dedicated working class party, I think that you should go even further than just one member. Maybe um, empowering the um, state committee when they're filling vacancies to go down the list of anyone else. So you take the number one person, that's the one member. There's a, another vacancy, the two, another vacancy, the three, uh, and so on. Um, and you had a, a few other things like Article 1, you put the number one instead of Roman numeral one. And uh, a couple times you say Coco Committee and VPP Party in there. Those are other notes I have on the bylaws. I'm really into bylaws. Um, so Feel free to give me those, those edits. The one thing I was just feedback, which I think applies to the, everything with the Coco, is you can organize. There's nothing preventing anybody from organizing. So if Burlington feels like, hey, we don't have somebody, then like organize. You got 25% of the delegates to, from Chittenden County coming there and you're the largest block, organize. Elected officials, you're going to have, like, you're tapped into the party, I'm guessing at the state committee elections, if you say this is my person, uh, that's gonna carry great weight and organize ahead of time. So, and some of it is a lack of, so part of it from my perspective is you can organize just like everybody else, but just that's another point I wanted to throw out there. Uh, uh, yeah, one more note on that. Trying to get involved in like, party meetings like this for a while, and it you know, only today did I like hear about the actual process for electing the coordinating committee. And so, with the process of like caucuses or any like democratic structure, I think you should put in language that um, some requirement about notifying people uh, well ahead of time, like you know through electronic notification a month in advance of the meeting, just so it's it's clear to everyone that would want to be involved that this thing is happening. Yeah, yeah, we do. We, there is language um, around notification. And it's notification to the state committee members, um, which is maybe yeah. And like sometimes we do more public, and sometimes it's just to the state committee members. But that's yeah, that's something. Well, I'm saying yeah. to the public. The public, yeah. The yeah. Yeah. No, and the caucuses. The caucuses are notified. Yeah, to the public generally. Um, and I, yeah, just on the youth caucus too, the youth piece as well, I would say that um, that was something we also considered and that was kind of the same position as the BIPOC piece. So I would encourage you and other folks to kind of submit ideas for how that would actually be structured um, to us because I think, I think we, we did discuss and we are open to all of that stuff. Um, we just like didn't have, you know, the wherewithal to like think about specific like, like how that would be structured. Um, 
but that was part of the conversation. And then Spoon and then Traven, and then I think we're gonna move on to the organizing piece. Spoon. Um, by way of introduction, I'll just point out there have been lots and lots of studies recently, and more and more all the time, pointing to very serious societal problems because of the isolation that we all feel, the atomization of human society, our uh, large, uh, a lot, most of it has to do with our electronic age, and of course it was uh, made a lot worse through COVID and stuff like that. And all these studies being involved in education a little bit of young people in, in experiencing uh, clinical depression, loneliness, suicides, etc., because they're home in their, in their rooms trying to be friends over a cell phone. Um, so now, with that in mind, I'm, go I'm gonna also get back to the, to the subject I, that, that I wanna maintain of solidarity. Solidarity may be impossible if we don't spend more time as human beings with each other. And I, th I think that that is what may become clear in the future. And we're a s fairly small party. I enjoy being a part of it. Our progressive values and statements and philosophy mean everything to me, and, and they should mean everything to, to, to everybody. And now to get to the exact point, I would like the committee working on these bylaws to think about adding something that would say to re have a progressive nomination would require the candidate to appear at, at least two of the four state meetings. At least one during the legislative time and one at another time. And in as much as we make our schedules a year in advance, and all of the things that a legislature or, or an administrator will do normally, being able to plan for such a thing is not a problem. It's just a normal part of what they do in those jobs. But it's not just, it's not just adding, I'm not, not just trying to add, add, add work, I'm trying to create, be, to set something. If we want to be activists in our party, I like to come to these meetings to talk to, to meet personally, to say hello, to be known, to shake hands, to have a word with my legislators that are up there that I am at home promoting and whom I don't even know. And now it's a little bit more, maybe it's, it's, it's a little bit, I've had a progressive uh, legislature in uh, my district or, or in my town for many years, no longer, but uh, it, it was somebody who enjoyed being a part of the Progressive Party for whatever reasons, but never really had an, who enjoyed being a progressive in the legislature, but never really showed much interest in the party, either here among us or at home. And it just felt a shame to me and, and a little d defeated that that this kind of, th uh, of relationship could exist. So I'm just looking, I'll stop here, to see perhaps to have this committee consider um, for a vote when the, when the final thing is done, something along the lines that will increase the obligations, responsibilities, or contact between our legislators and our party. Thank you. Thank you, Spoon. Um, Travis, you have that? Yeah, um, I, I, I want to second the things that Trey said about 
um, labor, um, all of which becomes very complicated. I mean, there's, we name, for example, three, three unions or union federations. There are other unions in the state, like UNAP and UE and others. Um, and this, this is important um, because, I mean, politically, in terms of our party having us developing a strong base in the organized working class, and that's important long term in terms of class formation as well. Um, I, I just think there's got to be more thought, and I, I don't have any quick answers to that. I mean, clearly, there's very different levels of uh, rank and file engagement and uh, political perspectives in the different unions, and how that's all going to work out is important, um, which is why maybe that suggestion for actually having um, votes, an online vote, um, which will be cumbersome and time consuming, but um, probably important. Yeah. I'll, I'll leave it there. So, yeah, th thank you, Travin. Um, yeah, and again, if, if folks have further feedback, um, this is the start of the process. Um, please submit all of these ideas as well. I think Elijah's been taking notes on this, but it would be helpful to have it. You know, if, have, have your comments also on the online form that we're, we've sent out, and um, we'll continue to take feedback from um, as we, you know, launch into the process. And, you know, I think we have a good process going forward. We have another three months to kind of work some of this stuff out before we get to a final vote at the next state meeting. And again, you know, we're hoping to get to a point where everyone can be happy and, and will love what the committee's done. And we also know that might not be the case, and that's perfectly fine. And um, people can propose amendments to the final the final draft, and we can have that conversation um, at the next state meeting, and um, you know just have some good votes and good healthy debate on it, and um, you know move move the party forward. But we're going to try to incorporate as much of this as we can, and yeah, with that we really got to move on because we want to spend significant time um, talking about summer organizing plans. Um, but thanks so much, Elijah. You've been awesome. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with you on this. Um, I do also want to point out, I think Will came, um, well, I think wasn't here when we, maybe you were here, I just didn't see you. What? No, no, I, I can't okay. leave, my, my car broke down around yeah. two. Uh, oh, no. Uh, but uh, thanks for, Sarah, let me know that you introduced me to yeah. Absentia, Josh, thanks for that. Yeah. Uh, and I don't want to take any more time, so if folks want to meet me in chat after the fact, maybe that would be great. Uh, but, Great to be here, sorry, Yeah, yeah, and Will, Will drafted the first draft of the housing resolution we passed earlier, so he's been incredible to work with. Um, so with that, I want to introduce Lynn Barnes. Lynn is one of the new members of our coordinating committee who has recently stepped into the chair role for the organizing committee, and she's going to lead us through a process for um, kind of launching the start of our summer organizing plans. And the idea of this is that we're going to start early and try to kind of set some meetings um, all around the state where folks can really tie into. And we're really looking to all of you to kind of help lead that process. Um, so Lynn's going to talk more about that. So thanks so much, Lynn. Sure. Do we have the microphone? It's, it's dead. Oh, OK. Sorry. All right. Um, I'll try to use my outside voice. <laughs> so um, once again, I'm Lynn Barnes. I'm in Waitsfield. And um, we've been working on the organizing committee since last fall. Um, the organizing committee came out of the state committee sessions two sessions ago, where we broke into breakout groups. And we have been meeting fairly regularly. It was um, about every two weeks during the legislative session in order to support legislators and mobilize people around issues. And before I get too far into this, I'd like to read what our mission statement is. Our mission is to engage more Vermonters through grassroots organizing to support key issues for our legislators in Montpelier, as well as strengthening local town committees, building on the ground infrastructure and community. So we're, um, we're tasked with not only supporting legislators, but helping towns and county committees grow. And um, I'd like to acknowledge a few people who have really been instrumental in, in this beginning part of the organizing session. Um, Sarah, 
I don't see Sarah. Oh, Sarah. Sarah and Josh have been really helpful, especially since this I'm new to this, so they've been very gracious in helping me move into the position. And Chloe Tomlinson was very involved for a while, and she's had to move on to some other things. Um, and with that said, uh, we do have a lot of exciting things coming up this summer, and so I'm hoping that there are other people here in this room who would like to participate on the organizing committee um, and certainly come up and see me or contact Josh. And the people who have already been involved, could you just raise your hands? We've had a number of people who have, Martha, Ken, Doug, great, great. So um, thanks for your help with this. Um, and our, right now our meeting schedule isn't as regular, um, but we're planning to meet this coming Wednesday at 7 p.m. over Zoom. So if you're available Wednesday and you want to see what it is we discuss, please join us. Um, so one of the things that we did was we organized state house visits, and the feedback from that was really good. Um, so roughly once a month, um, we would invite people and we'd get um, a small number of people who would come to the state house, meet with the lieutenant governor, and um, he was very helpful in explaining how people could get more involved and be activists. And then um, we would go to the Progressive Caucus and observe that process, which was very interesting. And everyone who participated came back with really great feedback. Um, they felt more connected to their legislators. They felt like they understood the process more, felt like they had more confidence to get involved. Um, so it was a really great exercise, and I'm hoping that we can continue that. Um, and we also had people who went to the State House and then became involved in other ways. So it's a, a really good way to get our membership up. Um, Oh, one of the things that happened during this time was the elections bill, um, and because of getting people out to the state house and um, meeting regularly as an organizing committee, we were able to mobilize people to really come out and speak out about the elections bill. We had a number of people who made phone calls, we had people who sent emails, and we even had some Zoom meetings with legislators. Um, and it's really important for legislators to hear what people are thinking about these things because um, when I contacted my legislators, they just thought it was a done deal and they, you know, um, they weren't in, really interested in hearing more about it. But we kind of pressed the issue and one of the um, legislators, I'm not sure which way she voted, but it seemed like she was leaning more towards to supporting um, the Progressive Party stand on this. So it's really important for uh, us to educate each other and educate our, our legislators because they there are so many things that they're dealing with and it's helpful for them to know what the different issues are and what some of the ramifications are that they may not have thought of themselves. So th we're moving into the next phase of this committee since we've had um, we've supported the legislature. Now we're going to move into building our communities and prepare for reorganization in the fall. And the way we're going to do that is we're, we're asking everyone here to get together with the people in your area and plan an event. Um, it could be a potluck, it could be a barbecue, um, house party, whatever works best for you. And it would be a way to get the people in your area interested in getting involved, get them engaged so that when we do reorganization, um, we already have some people who are thinking about these things. And um, so that's what we plan to do next. Um, have I missed anything around this? Um, I don't think so, but I just want to recognize Lynn as being super amazing and having just like been, I feel like, by my side through David's campaign and through Josh's side through, and everyone's side. Lynn is just awesome. I'm really excited that she's doing this. And I just think that this will be like a great way to really bring us all together again and um, hopefully, you know, get some momentum for elections and also the legislative session and pushing issues and building solidarity and community like Spoon was saying because loneliness is a disease. It sucks. Anyway, yeah, Thanks. take it away. Thanks. <laughs> so um, are there any questions before we move to the next part? Carter. 
just thank you for all the work. It's really exciting. Um, and I feel like in that COVID, it's really nice to, yeah, to be able to connect with the rest of and see the work that you have done. So thanks for that. It's really appreciated. And thank you for getting that moving. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Be before we break up, I just want to, Liz Medina just came. Liz is a ED of the AFL-CIO, so just wanted to give her a shout out, and we do love that. Um, we had some good conversation on labor um, and our relationships with labor earlier, so we always love to have the, um, you know, have representatives here from our labor sisters and brothers, and yeah, we just want to continue to build those relationships, so thanks for coming. Um. Okay, so we're going to move into the part now where you actually get to stand up. <laughs> um, so uh, we're going to break out into small groups um, by geographical area. So um, um, we're going to have a group from Chittenden, a group from Washington County, and a group from the Northeast Kingdom. And then I know I, there are a couple other people who don't fall into those areas, and Sarah's going to work with them. Um, so. And during this time, we're going to ask you to think about what kind of summer event you could have to get some excitement going, um, get people together, um, kind of a low pressure, but you know, with, with the focus of really um, energizing our base. Uh, so um, during the breakout session, what we're going to do is ask you to break up into the groups, and then we're going to do just a quick icebreaker where you say your name, your town, and what your favorite summer activity is uh, as we move into summer. Um, and we'll, each group will need a note taker, so if someone in the group could, could volunteer to do that. Um, and that note taker, you're going to make a list of who is in your breakout group so we can follow up later. Um, identify who the point person will be, so as, as we get moving into the summer, people in the organizing committee will be reaching out to that point person to help you with your event. Um, look at some possible dates and locations and types of gatherings that you could have. Um, identify who you might want to invite and who will do what. And think about what you might need as support from the party in this process too. We know that not everyone can do everything. so. Um, we want to make this something that's fun and easy, and um, so think about what kinds of support you might need. <clears throat> um, and then plan up, <clears throat> excuse me, plan when your next follow-up meeting will be. So kind of work on the, the outline for now of what that event might look like, and then when you can meet again as a group, and we'll be following up with the organizing committee. So. Um, are there questions? No, did I cover everything? I think so, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, Thank you, Bud. Thanks. Yeah, and again, so yeah, we're breaking out into regions, so if folks can get into. We're going to do. Um, Is this going to happen in 15 minutes? Or are we staying over? Yeah, so if we can, uh, let's, let's, let's allocate five minutes extra. Um, so let's try to be done by 105, and then um, we'll call it at that, if that's okay with folks. So. If you have to take a quick bathroom break, um, do that, and then let's um, let's meet into our regions. And Sarah, do you want to just direct people to where they're meeting? Yeah, so we don't really have folks from all of our geographic regions, which are pretty much just two to three county sections. So I was thinking we could just do Washington County, Chittenden County, Northeast Kingdom slash Franklin County, and then our folks from Rutland and Wyndham County could come join me and we can hang out. If, and if anyone has yeah. any qualms with that, that's also fine. Yeah, we where, where should folks gather? Um, sure, maybe yeah. we do like Chittenden over Top up right. in this corner. NEK is already down here. NEK, yeah. yeah. NEK bottom left. <laughs> Southeast Kingdom, kind of? And then uh, we could do Washington maybe over there. Okay. Washington over there, yeah. So the idea is that you're setting a time date and thinking about a location for an event and like what the parameters of that event will be. And you have about 20 minutes to do that. And there could be multiple events yeah. if you want.